A rare black leopard was trapped in a snare today. Pattern Nalathaniel Vika Patil in the Puriyal Siki, Kaimadi in the Renda. Upper Varta Karu Pavasui, Ada Dahaval Kale, Sitter, Emasatua, Beragani Mada, Vanachi Vinil the Harin, Pratikara Karnababa. The black leopard, which was rescued from a snare in Hatton, recently died today. A Udavalabe at Atrusevane in the current Rutte Uiran Tulado. When someone asks me about a leopard, for me, what jumps to mind always is the fact that it's magnificent. I mean, it's beautiful. For anyone who's seen a leopard out there in the wild, moving around the way it moves, you will understand. Your breath stops. It'll turn and it'll look at you, and you have no idea, in a way, what it's thinking. So when you see such a magnificent creature as the leopard getting caught in this snare, it's a horrible death for the leopard. So right now we are at the Hatton town. So from the Hatton town we have to travel to Maskelia and from Maskelia we'll be going to the Lakshapan estate. So the Lakshapan estate is where this incident happened, where this rare black leopard got caught in a snare and it died. So why we are going to Lakshapan is to understand first of all how it happened and most importantly why it happened. The Lakshapan estate is quite unique because it is situated right beneath the Adams Peak, bordering the peak wilderness, the kingdom of the leopard. So the Sri Lankan leopard is a genetic subspecies uh, and the reason it is this or it has evolved to be so is because for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, the land has been separated enough geographically for the leopard here to have evolved enough genetic markers to be considered as a separate subspecies. So it is Panthera pardis cotia. When it comes to population numbers, this is something that, you know, it takes a long time to come up with actual numbers. You have to do multiple density studies, understand where they are in different habitats, and then come up with numbers. It's never exact. It's never going to be exact. We have done work for now 20 years, and what we've put forward is roughly around 850 mature individuals on the island. There's a range, of course, from around, you know, 700, 650, 700 to 1,000, 1,050, right? And like I said, it's a margin of error because these are wild animals. You can't give exact numbers. So we first did 2008, and now in 2018, 10 years later, we've done a census comparative, a, a number estimate comparative, and we are not seeing uh, a decrease, right? We're still seeing pretty much similar numbers. finally arrived at the Lakshapan estate and as you can see behind me this is the village within the estate so this estate is special not just because of the incident of the black leopard 
but we observe that there is a very strange relationship between the people in the estate and the wilderness around it. Around me you can see a long chain of mountainous forest and this forest is prime with wildlife, including that of the leopard. Lakshapana estate uh, with this uh, construction of the Mausakali Dam, they cultivated a division called this, actually they cleared the land in Hamilton and part of Walamali division. They, they started in 1961 and my factory is a new factory which, is, which was built in 1961 and the manager's bungalow. Uh, the old factory and the old uh, bungalow went underwater, that is just below the main road and we are bordering the peak wilderness which, which is a unique uh, thing what Lakshapana has and I have a population of 5000 out of which 1050 uh, are workers so balance 4000 we don't have much hold on them. On the 26th of May what happened that morning exactly? So um, uh, this particular morning on 26th morning just below my bungalow not even uh, 50 feet the guy has seen a, seen a leopard that got caught to a trap Then he informed the police. The police came then the wildlife also came and uh, what happened was the veterinary guys from wildlife took little time, they, they, they started from uh, Andhirigala and they came, they reached there by 11.30 and they rescued the leopard. They took them to uh, Mausa Kale camp and treated the leopard and they took them to, uh, took the guy to uh, Udawalavi. Basically the estate workers uh, had never seen this leopard, the first time they are seen. They was Pahala Vaurudhi Vagi Dawasaka Mang Hotel Lekha Adhan Dawasaka Me Hotel Lekha Palle Hang Vagi Yanova Dekka Mang Dawasaka Namud Mang Eda Adhani Ka Tinae Me Kalu Gotiya Ma Dekila Mago Tawat Sattu Inna Hinda Me Hebe Da Mang Kalu Varna Etta Mae Dekke Namud Harita Ma Kiyan Na Beri Hinda Mang Kaatwa Chivu Vene Okay, so a black leopard is a leopard It's just an expression of it's It's actually a double recessive gene so both parents of that black individual have to have that gene within them for it to occur. So it's very rare. Um, globally, about 11% of leopards are actually black, according to global data. But they're, sp they're not spread out equally, so they're very, uh, they're very spatially sort of segregated. So in somewhere like peninsular Malaysia, you get a lot of black leopards. Like most of the population of leopards is black in that particular rainforest. Some other areas you'll get a small percentage, some places you just don't get any like that. But uh, you can have a, a black leopard that has a sibling who is a spotted leopard. So it's like that. I mean, they're, they're just a leopard. <laughs> the peak wilderness, defined as the forest surrounding the peaks of the central highlands, is believed to be a haven for black leopards. In terms of the distribution of black leopards, um, typically it's an adaptive trait. So where the, the forest is dense and dark, obviously being black could be more of an advantage from a hunting perspective, right? Whereas if you're in a savanna type area or a more open, more grassland type area, then being black is not going to be much of an advantage, right? So that's probably, that, that, that's what links to the distribution. So in Sri Lanka, you get the black leopards that we have seen in the last few years. In 2009, there was one killed down by Hinaduma. In 2013, in the same area, Obviously this one this year up uh, near Nalatanya, so up in the, 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 the lowland rainforest or the sort of mid-elevation rainforest and then up into the hills where vegetation is fairly more dense. Um, apparently in the past there, there have been other examples of black leopards in other parts of the country, um, but we just haven't seen much of that recently. So usually the distribution, again, a global study that we were part of, uh, looked at this and linked it quite directly to sort of denser rainforests and denser forests. This black leopard, no one has seen. This is the first time they have seen. My workers, there are plenty of leopards around because of the, because of the peak wilderness. So, uh, workers are scared, but uh, they think that leopard might attack them. Namma prachana panna ta sir, adhi namma kaapu. Namma dhan 
අවුරුදු 32ක් මේ වචන කෙනෙක් හැටියට රසා කරන මොන කරුවෙක් හැටියට මම වැඩ කරන එක ඉන්න ගමන් මිනිසු කිව්වා මේ මෙම පැටිය පැටව දෙන්න කිනවා කියලා මම හිතන්නේ ළඟට ගිහිල්ලා අපි ඊට කලින් අපිට කියලා තිබෙන මේ මේ කොටි පස්නේ තියනවා ටේරින් දුන්නානේ ඒකට මම ඒක වැඩ කියලා තිබ්බා ටග්ගල මිනිසු කණ්ඩායම මට කිව්වා මම ඉන්නවා කියලා ඒක මම ඒගොල්ලන්ට ඇතුලින් යන්න කිව්වා ඔසේ එක එක පොඩි පැටියක මම දැක්කා උඩට පල්ලා ගියා ඒක මම මම කිව්වා මේ අම්මා ඇතිනේ in terms of uh, man eating leopards or threats to humans from leopards in Sri Lanka thankfully it's very very low i mean really when you think about it you know what does a person represent to a leopard it really doesn't represent a food source and thankfully it really hasn't in the country what it represents mostly is a threat right so 99 times out of 100 a leopard will hear the approach or sense or you know whatever the approach of a person and will just sl- quietly slip away off the trail. I mean I've come face to face walking with a leopard with a mother and her cub and I mean you know they just want to get out of there. Bang, they just want to go. <laughs> so that's what happens almost all the time, right? The occasional incident the incident that you get in Sri Lanka is usually when an animal's been surprised, sometimes up in the hills in the dense tea bushes, an animal gets surprised at a kill. And usually it's defensive wounds the animal again is still trying to get away but uh, might scrape might bite that kind of thing um the last you know there was the famous man eater of punani back in whatever that was the 30s or 40s or whatever it was um so genuinely you might get the odd case but when you think about how many people there are in the country how many leopards there are the long history of shared space it's pretty remarkable Leopard attacks on humans are rare in Sri Lanka. The numbers are low compared to that of India and Nepal. Uh in Sri Lanka I mean the only really ever documented one was the man eater of Punani. Uh again, you know, very gray area and sure. Um other than for that there isn't anything here. It has been reported that its first victim was a boy in the area of Ponani. Most of its victims were killed close to the 28th mile post on the Polonnaruwa road. Jim Corbett in his book Man Eaters of Kumuan stated, when a tiger becomes a man eater, it loses all fear of human beings. We don't have the uh, situation here or the landscape and scenario that in some other countries can create uh, a carnivore to become a man eater an example being uh, we don't put our dead bodies on the river and burn like in india they do and you might have a half uh, burnt carcass of a human ending up in a forest area right so an animal might come across that and you know consume that that doesn't happen here Uh, the leopard here is the top of the chain in that sense right it's our top predator uh, it has no competition so it can choose the best pick it's not going to want to eat a human right it leave the amount of prey we still have good wild prey here the unique landscape of the hills poses a new challenge to the leopard pushing it to adapt and be much more unique than its lowland counterparts up in the hills we see clearly that in a human dominated landscape where there are you know people spread throughout the landscape working in the landscape so their presence on the landscape is very high uh and there are quite a few leopards still the leopards have adapted by essentially not being active in the day so they've responded to that you know the presence of people by altering their behavioral patterns to be much more active in the night when people are absent from the landscape for the most part and that differs from the national parks you know in the national parks we see it, leopards are more active in the in the night still but there is some low level of activity in the day you'll see them moving around walking up in the hills you get very little of that so again it's 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 the leopard trying to avoid this kind of this kind of incident the day is coming to an end and people safely lock themselves away in their homes the night gathers And now it's time for the leopard. It's night time at the Lakshman estate. At times like this, people know better than to step outside. So the path right behind me is known to be frequented by leopards. And if you look around, 
This path is based right in the middle of the estate. And leopards use paths like this to travel between estates to reach other points of wilderness. Uh, first of all, I understand why the leopard come to, towards the worker's cottage. The reason is there is enough food for them, like easy food. They come towards their worker cottages, take the dogs and go. So what I told my workers, we had another, uh, during the awareness I told my workers is, you put these dogs, lock them up by five o'clock, put them into their cages. The people living in the central highlands appear to have established coexistence with their surrounding nature. However, flaws in this relationship could at times prove fatal. So right now we are at the place where the leopard was caught. So behind me is where the leopard was caught, right Mr. Man? Exactly, yes. Can you show, point out the place exactly? Actually it was uh, somewhere here. The snare was uh, arranged somewhere here. Right. And the leopard was basically some in this place. Right. You see the, all this smashed uh, grass because of that his section. The struggling, right. Yeah. So uh, the leopard would have come through that place, eh? Uh, yes, generally they uh, <coughs> follow what uh, a path right. used by other animals. So you want know some opening only they uh, walk other, uh, or else uh, through a waterway. So these are the vegetable crops that were apparently been uh, protected from the wild animals, right? Yes. Right. So Actually, this you can see that this uh, recently op um, uh, recent open up. Yeah. Uh, because now, following to this corona incidents, uh, most of the people who were working in Colombo uh, got back to their uh, uh, native places. So here also we have big number of uh, people who are returned from Colombo. These recent incidents of the five uh, or four leopards that were caught to snares, uh, it has been during the COVID-19 period, right, where we've had a lockdown curfew. And so what has happened is a lot of people have gone back to their homes, to their villages, or in the case of Nalatanya, back to the tea estates that they came from. So in Nalatanya and in that whole area, the central highlands, and the tea escape landscape really, there's a lot of humans on the landscape, and a lot of them live outside of the tea estate and work outside. So the, they all came back during this time period, which means there's a lot more mouths to feed. There's a lot of people there who don't have jobs, who aren't working. So the increase in vegetable plots then was uh, visible. And of course, snaring, no doubt, is what also occurred. Whether it was only to protect the new vegetable crops or for meat as well, I would assume it was for both. Yeah, so how a snare works is, you, you know, obviously it's just a wire that is in a noose, essentially. And so when the animal encounters that, and a part of the body goes through, and it continues on its way, that noose tightens. And the snare is attached, the wire goes and it's attached in various ways, either it's tied to a tree, or else it's attached to a long piece of wood that then catches in the, in the, you know, the V or the notch of a tree, and basically doesn't move. And so there were, as the leopard, or other animal, moves through, the noose tightens. So it's most typically around the neck or around the midriff, but it can also be on legs, this kind of thing. And then obviously the more an animal struggles to get out, the tighter it gets. And so it's obviously a very, it's a nasty death. It can be a very nasty death because it can take a long time and it can be very painful obviously. And there's, you know, you can lie there for a long time with this ever tightening uh, uh, wire. It can cause obviously external injuries, um, really bad in external injuries, but it can also um, cause internal injuries, which are ultimately often the cause of death. So sometimes you'll get an animal that gets released from a snare. It doesn't look that bad, it might have some, you know, but internally there's been a lot of damage done to the or internal organs, especially the ones that are on the waist. So effects of snaring on leopards, uh, here in Sri Lanka specifically, again, it's something that Either it seems to be on the rise or it's now we're aware of it and we're keeping note of it and it's, uh, you know, media also exposes the threats and the incidents that happen. So it could be both. It could be that it happened before and we just didn't know or, and now we know more about it so it seems a lot more 
overall, from the time we've been keeping statistics, and this is also, you know, wildlife department uh, statistics and ours and other people put all together, uh, it's roughly about in the past 10 years, we've had uh, 47 leopards caught in snares, of which 42 have died. Overall, we have an average of about five leopards, leopard incidents, leopard deaths that are occurring per year, right? Recently, when we just did some comparative analysis, we are finding it's a little bit more, so it's going like to about seven. Whether that is spiking because of this particular five incidents like we mentioned, and you know, in 2016 also we had about eight leopards that were killed in the space of a couple of months, and that was, we felt, because of the drought and the sudden onset of rains. Um, so whether it's, you know, a natural disaster, climate change, human-induced scenarios like this pandemic, there are going to be these spikes. Um, but overall, the threat of snares to leopards, what we are finding is that it is more so that we know of in the central highlands, right? So snaring as a threat is more in the central highlands. Whereas in our lowlands, it's other forms, such as retaliatory killing, so poisoning of leopards because, say, livestock have been taken, for example. So, Mr. Mahendra, this leopard was caught in close proximity to the village. I mean, the village is right there. Yes. And uh, it's technically the center of the estate, right? Uh, yeah, you can say so. Right, so then why would the leopard come this close to human establishment? Uh, generally, they come in search of uh, dogs. Uh, because uh, dogs is one of the easiest prey for them. Right. Because uh, the, uh, the reason is now, once uh, a dog is confronted with a leopard, uh, they get freeze. Why is that? Uh, the reason is un not known. Okay. But uh, uh, that is the observation. Uh -huh. Even uh, if a uh, dog is in a uh, kennel and uh, uh, confronted with a uh, leopard, uh, he will not eat for a while, uh, maybe for one week. That sort of scare. <laughs> oh, right, right. Okay. And uh, so now that is the peak wilderness, right? Over yes, there? over there. So the three part, the mountain and the peak yes, wilderness. Yes, yes. So why, are, why don't the leopards just stay in the forest? Like why do they come into estates? Now actually, uh, uh, the recent work done by uh, Dr. Andrew Kittle and uh, Anjali Watson, they have established that uh, some leopard families are resided in tea estates uh, where you get uh, forestry blocks or some shrublands or jungles mm. uh, with uh, cave sort of arrangements. Mm. So generally uh, females are resided uh, and uh, the males are visiting them. So now you said uh, that leopards actually live on the property, they live inside the estate. So doesn't that pose a significant threat to the people living in the estate? Uh, not really I would say. Uh, because uh, uh, they, uh, this had been the case all this time, uh, maybe from the colonial times. Right. But the reason is now generally plantation community until recent, by 637 they close their lines and uh, go to sleep. These animals are nocturnal, so there is hardly any chance of uh, 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 getting a confrontation. And that is probably because of the fact that the landscape is quite cut up. It's a mixed habitat, so leopards have to move through certain non-forested habitats. They're not the best movement corridors for them often. And then that is also where they come across these snares. This black leopard recently, it was around the neck, and so it had a large hematoma on the neck from this, and the, the, there was some blood that I think went into the lungs, that sort of thing. So a lot of stuff can happen internally as well that you don't necessarily notice from outside. With the incident of the black leopard, many question the response of the Department of Wildlife and the efforts undertaken by them, conveniently overlooking the difficulties they face themselves. When, uh, when one uh, wild animal caught in a snare, he's struggling to escape. Uh, the bad effect of this uh, struggling is causes khatcha mayapati. The death of the uh, muscle tissue as well as the other tissues in the organs. And also, uh, there is a condition called acute stress disease syndrome. What we, what we 
face in, uh, in patient in uh, COVID. So it's similar similar thing uh, due to the stress, highly stress. Animal is exposed, animal is uh, under direct sunlight. Uh, everything will increase the stress levels. And this, uh, you know, that alveoli of the lung is a tissue which can permit uh, gases exchange. So alveoli will rupture and there is no functional tissue to move. So then uh, that can cause death because no air yeah, exchange. First call uh, received to the uh, our field office at Nalatanya. It's around uh, 10.30. I, I am also received this information. Then I directed a uh, message uh, both locations. Uh, Randonigal uh, veterinary office as well as the elephant transit of veterinary office. So we send uh, two teams, both locations. And they have taken two and a half hours to reach the place. So this is uh, normal traffic and uh, there are so many people who uh, try to arrangement of uh, air lifting. While they are trying, we are uh, we have tried our best to reach the place. I, I got a message that they have came uh, around 2.30 for the location. Since then, animal is struggling. Isn't there an office or centre close by that can respond faster? Yes, but they don't have uh, veterinary facilities in the, in the, in the uh, field offices. So, we can rescue the animal, but afterwards there are a lot of uh, bad effects remain in the body. Two doctors have observed that animal, so we, uh, we discuss each other. I myself discuss each other, the possibility of release the animal at the location, at the same time. So they said uh, there are six wound cut appear on the neck and uh, there are some uh, bleeding on thorax also. This could lead to infected wound when time being. So if we if we release that animal, it could die in the in the in the location, in the his uh, his periphery, his uh, home range. So it's it's a uh, when it happens, so it's our, it's our negligence. Nobody else. It's our negligence. So we thought we should uh, look observe the animal very closely and keep the animal in, in safe place. Uh, so this best location is elephant transit home Odawalaga. It has unique facilities, I mean best facilities now. So we, we observe the animal, second day I went there and we observe the animal with thermal cameras. Anything happen in the body, it reflects in a generate heat, I mean inflammations related to heat, which can monitor externally without uh, touching the animal. So we, we saw that the animal has lot of heat in these areas, high, high heat areas in the body. So according to that, we start treatments and we, uh, we saw that uh, snare marks all over the face as well as the neck, so we inject this animal to antibiotics and uh, we do some painkillers as also well. But we notice the animal has a big pain and there is a dyspnea, little uh, difficult breathing. So these are the signs of uh, damage of the internal issue of the lung. So uh, this animal is died. Hemadi, Iga Naduan, Mandaki, and Nava, Mesata, Marano, Nigilor, 
එහෙම ආවේගයක් කතා වෙන්නේ නැහැ මේ මොකද උගේ දඩුවම නේද උගේ ගොදුරක් තමයි ඉතින් අපේ වරද තමයි බල්ලා ඉඳිය දාලා තිබ්බ ඒක දැන් ඔය කියන්නේ අපිට දුක තමයි සර් ඉතින් ඌ බෑ කරේ නේ සර් ඉරලා හිටියේ එතකොට ගංකලනවා එතනම ඉතින් ඒකට අපිට දුක තමයි ियोजेंटल yet it's the leopard that's getting caught and like i said we've lost 42 animals to snares in the past 10 years not meant to be killed whatsoever but still killed uh they're not doing anything harmful in this scenario they're just moving through the landscape and getting killed um so it is an utter shame in that sense it's a horrible death for the leopard because of course it will struggle to get out of it uh you know we, we've had a mother that got killed this way and we found the cub right so these are solitary creatures there's no pack to look after the other animal right people don't aren't meaning to kill the leopard here yet it is happening so snares are something that i think we really need to think about more now and realize that it's a no no you know it we've come to that point i hope There is a society we can realize. Okay, I didn't mean to set the snare to kill a leopard, so really that's not my fault. But it is killing a leopard, so we have to look at it like that now, and uh, come to that point where we all realize that snares are not something we need to tolerate anymore on our landscape. Snares are illegal according to their purpose and according to the type of animal for which the snare is being set up. For instance, every snare is or to cause unnecessary pain and suffering, and sometimes injury and death to animal. And therefore, a snare is illegal under the Cruelty to Animals Ordinance because it causes unnecessary pain, unnecessary suffering, injury, harm, mutilation, and even death to the animal. Therefore, anyone who keeps any snare for any type of animal can be charged under the Cruelty to Animals Ordinance for that simple reason. In addition, if the snare is intended to be used against wildlife, the person could be charged under the provisions of the Fauna and Flora Protection Ordinance. In addition, to be charged under the Cruelty to Animals Ordinance. So, if it is a wild animal for which the snare is intended to be, the person is liable to be charged under two ordinances or two enactments or two laws, as we call it. As I said before, snares are illegal in any context. So, even if it is being set up for catching wild boars is still illegal so sometimes these are things that are not intended to catch leopards but are intended to catch other animals but sometimes leopards become fair prey so that is the second thing that we have to stop any person who is keeping snares uh, to catch any animal should be penalized and the law enforcement mechanism has to be strengthened now sometimes this happens inside in estates so the authority in charge of the estate should take responsibility to seek their properties uh, devoid of snares i think that is happening now well uh, we have undertaken a lot of programs for the past uh, 7 to 10 years uh, in our areas like you know maskelia upcot talavakale bandaral and namulukula regions and since uh, we have got this uh, rainforest alliance uh, certification prior to that we started this uh, programs like you know biodiversification protecting uh, wildlife and uh, forestry all our uh, including executive staff and workforce have been well trained and we have been been periodical training programs uh, we had a, after this incident we had a very useful uh, Then as program with the wildlife, that's on the first of June. We we got down all the cultivators, mostly non-workers, which we have very less hold on them. They came, some of our workers, our field of our, our uh, field watchers. We had a very useful awareness program, and uh, we thought we have to give it a start to collect all the snares, which we did. 
and uh, you won't believe within 10 days we collected 56, 56 snares and subsequently we had another session with the, the top wildlife officials I think there were about 35 what I am trying to emphasize is uh, now if now we are trying to organize a, with the PA and the Friends of Hawking Plains there are about 120 estates we are trying to gather all the superintendents to TRI have a meeting with them and we are going to explain to them like now I, I uh, collected 56 snares within two weeks so basically if all the estates can collect 10 snares say 100 estates 1000 snares we can save 1000 animals I think that is the initiative which we are going to drive the third is effective law enforcement which needs more personnel for the wildlife department and also the police and the other departments could also be mobilized to a certain extent to help this effect to be coordinated. But the crux of the problem lies in that the Department of Wildlife does not have adequate personnel to give a satisfactory degree of protection to the habitants and the wildlife and therefore we always want the department to enhance its capacity and capabilities both. The difficulties of the conserving the animals by poaching and snaring, the ecosystem is not only protected by the Department of Wildlife Conservation or Forest Department. It's a challenge to remove all the snares by Wildlife Department. So we have limited staff and we, we can't attend everywhere. We have to educate the people. They should respect the wildlife, the wildlife in Sri Lanka and the wildlife department do conserve the wildlife in protected area network as well as other areas in the country. But we couldn't uh, follow up by the department uh, without supporting of the general public. Uh, we need information. General public can uh, inform us who are the persons set up that stairs. So, when the number is 1992, we maintain our secrets. So when you want to stop the use of snares, obviously, you know, you, you need to have some sort of alternative in terms of why people are doing it. If people are putting, doing it just, just to get meat, okay, that, that, the issue there is, is, I guess, food security. So yeah, I need to address that issue. Are people genuinely not having enough food? Or is it to do with supplementing and then you can, you can address that? In terms of protecting your crop, you know, then you need to come again, come up with an alternative. How, if, if snares, are, are going to be cracked down upon, then you need an alternative. Um, for one thing that we talk about, I mean, we've done this recent, you know, sort of anti-snaring pamphlet sort of thing, and that, now that's a big issue, which is great. It's on the agenda. People are aware of this snaring menace. And so one thing that we talk about is the fact that snares actually aren't that effective, really. If it's a herd of wild boar coming into an area, you know, you might catch one in a snare, but the rest will probably still get in. So you need something better anyway. So things like, you know, stronger fencing, uh, electric fences are used obviously for elephants widely in the country. Uh, some of the estate guys are looking at sort of a smaller scale electric fencing, solar powered electric fences, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so those are some of the alternatives. But obviously that's the key thing, is to give people an alternative. Snares are now a threat for leopards that we will really need to seriously consider. Uh, and that is a specific threat. And sadly, this is also happening in an area where one of the largest threats to leopards, that of habitat depletion and fragmentation, terms that are used all the time, that are very visible on the hill country landscape. Right? It's a mixed landscape. We lost a lot of our highland forests 100 years ago to plantation land. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, eucalyptus and pinus and released grassland areas, but yet leopards are living there, very much so. So we've got this habitat degradation occurring, which we can address by reforesting, figuring out where leopards are moving and protecting those areas. So we've got that threat there of the habitat scenario, but then we've also got this other creeping threat of snares. Right? And because animals are having to move through marginal lands on this landscape, they are being impacted by these snares that are laid along these movement corridors. There will be a ridge established by 
the pl com uh, plantation companies in this area combinedly, uh, which uh, uh, runs from Bhogavanthala to almost uh, down to Norton Bridge and Kithulgala, which separates uh, Bogo Valley and the Muskelia Basin. So that is a ridge uh, they call that Peak Ridge, where uh, several uh, families of resident leopards have been uh, sighted. That's their uh, resident area. They are nocturnal and daytime they uh, find a hideout and just wait there, uh, basically sleep there. Uh, so uh, if you have, if you provide such uh, arrangements for them, uh, they won't be harmful for uh, human. So as a common person, civil society, what can we do to uh, address the scenario of snares, right? I would say first off is don't eat wild meat because that is coming from a source that most likely has had snares put out there, right? So don't uh, encourage that anymore because if there's a demand for that, then obviously there has to be a supply and the, the person supplying it is going to have to get it some way. We have to stop this practice now because it's killing anything and everything. It's indiscriminate, you know. It's, it's not a successful method of doing it. And you know, many people talk about it, push for it as a collective force. Uh, it really is possible. I mentioned this earlier too that, uh, you know, Sri Lanka had hunting, right? Our national parks were our hunting reserves. But we banned hunting. We managed to do that collectively because we realized that if not, we would decimate our wildlife populations. So we did that then, and I'm sure it went through a time period, right, where we didn't just overnight say, okay, we're banning hunting, everybody stop hunting. I mean, we still have hunting to a small level now, right? But we did it. And people, I'm sure we all know who used to hunt leopard before, you know, the older generation who did at one time are now ardent in their own way conservationists, right? Or like, you know, are very pro having wildlife around. So this, I think, is where we are again. We're at that junction again, where we can put a stop to snaring if collectively it's a decision and with all these various solutions, um, we push forward to have this stopped, just like we stopped hunting and made it completely illegal. Snares are already illegal, right? So it's already there in the law. It's a matter of being a collective want to now stop this practice. So we observed many sides to this story. Many sides that paint a broader, ever expanding picture to this situation. But through all this confusion, one thing remains certain. That is that there is a very special relationship between the people in this mountainous area and the wildlife that inhabit it. So what we could do as a people going forward is to make sure that we preserve this and make sure that we improve this for future generations.